right. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to attend today's webinar. My name is Chris Cooper, and I work for Cinemassive, a company headquartered in Atlanta, and we've been designing and deploying advanced video wall solutions for command and control rooms since 2005. Before we get started, please note that you can submit any questions you have in the chat box in the lower right, and we'll cover all of them at the end of the presentation. In addition, we'll be sending a link to the recording of this presentation to everyone who registered. So with that, I would like to turn the webinar over to Tom Polivka, our Vice President of Sales, who will kick us off. Thanks, Chris. And thanks again to all of you for taking the time to hear about the evolution of a new breed of real-time crime center that can support response to multiple converging incidents. After I provide a short introduction here, I'll introduce one of our most forward-thinking clients, the city of Naperville, Illinois, who will share some relevant lessons with us. We'll finish with a demonstration so you can see some of the newest innovations and concepts firsthand. I'd like to start by offering a quick overview of our qualifications for those of you who are not familiar with Cinemassive. First of all, we've designed and deployed over 800 systems worldwide. Some of these are single room projects, but many efforts entail repeat deployments for global enterprises. Along the way, we've created the broadest array of command center environments, from security and network operation centers, to utility control centers, and of course, real-time crime centers. We've deployed miniaturized, ruggedized technology to support mobile command centers for first responders and warfighters in the field. We've also supported arena-sized watch floors with hundreds of panels. Learning about how operators act and react in the command center environment has informed our product lifecycle decision and given rise to innovation, such as the ones we'll be discussing here that are relevant to real-time crime centers. As if fighting crime wasn't hard enough, weather-related response scenarios from tropical storms in the east to wildfires in the west and continued COVID intervention introduces new challenges, competes for resources, and broadens the role of law enforcement. So let's rethink the scenario that arises from multi-crisis response. To assess the capacity of modern RTCCs to adapt, we'll present a handful of key challenges and show how Cinemassive meets these from a proactive and reactive standpoint. In areas where there is no dedicated emergency operations center, RTCCs can take on the role of a multifunctional hub for reacting to coinciding crises. In this scenario, real-time crime centers, 911 dispatch, and traffic control are all contributing to co cooperative incident response. In testing RTCCs for required flexibility, we ask questions like, can a non-technical user create a new layout in minutes? Can all of the layout and behavior changes be accomplished without programming? Are all of your devices controllable directly from the same place? And can a novice user learn to operate the wall in under an hour? In a few minutes, Dustin will explain and demonstrate how our simplified Cinenet user interface effectively supports the dynamic RTCC model. Larger stationary command centers are table stakes for real-time crime operations. But the RTCC of the future must sometimes extend command and control to first responders in the field. A little later, Dustin will show how our ruggedized strike unit provides a portable command center in a 12-pound package the size of a large shoebox. With the ability to process 16 high-definition inputs and outputs, Strike can be set up and fully operational in under 15 minutes and can also stream its local view to a headquarters RTCC or another video wall. The traditional command center model of sequestering up to dozens of operators in a purpose-built environment flies in the face of social distancing guidelines. Working with DOD commanders in the battlefield, Cinemass have realized early on that command and control strategies could not assume that all decision makers were in the same room. As a result, we developed various methods for sharing and viewing video wall information from outside the command center that are compliant with COVID-related restrictions. When you watch Dustin's demo, please be aware that everything he is doing to control or view the wall is being accomplished from the comfort of his own office. In a few minutes, you'll hear Deputy Chief Ayers from Naperville talk about the growing reliance on social media monitoring in a real-time crime center. Since social media and other URL-based sources, such as those providing geospatial awareness, dedicate a compute resource to each stream, operator desktops are co-opted for website access. In extreme cases, entire racks are deployed to house single-purpose servers. Heavy GPU loads also choke RTCC processors, which become unusable over time and have to be replaced. To deal with this situation, Cinemassive has developed an appliance called CineAgent that is powerful, compact, and delivers the firepower to process up to four URL streams simultaneously. 
It's half the size of an average blade, costs less, and has almost no maintenance footprint. It also allows operators to directly interact with, not just view, websites. Dustin will demonstrate some of these distinct Cine agent advantages in the RTCC. Recapping our RTCC of the future vision and the global common operating picture it provides, we want to demonstrate how day-to-day -day access and certain operations can be moved off-site to accommodate the new restrictions around social distancing. Of course, we want to accomplish this without impacting decision-making by key staff that aren't in the facility. And we have to assume that first responders and other frontline operators may be using mobile command systems to stream content back to one or more stationary walls. Finally, it's important in real-time crime centers to support coalitions that span state and local as well as federal agencies. As individual RTCCs are dramatically improving situational awareness, we're seeing the evolution of regional fusion centers that unite neighboring law enforcement units to produce common outcomes. One of the best examples of this is the Eastern Metro Area Crime Center in Alabama. The EMAC, as it's commonly called, brings together 23 federal, state, and local agencies under one roof to solve regional crimes such as gun violence, human trafficking, drug dealing, and crimes against children. Since the ribbon cutting in early 2019, the EMAC has produced dramatic results, and I encourage everyone here to review the case study on our website and to do your own research online. Now I'm excited to transition to an interview where you'll hear Deputy Chief Jason Ayers of the Naperville, Illinois Police Department share his insights into benefits and best practices related to a modern real-time crime center. Hi, my name is Jason Aries. I am the Deputy Chief of the Patrol Division for the Naperville Police Department in Illinois. We're a city of about 150,000, uh, about 35 minutes southwest of Chicago. Okay, so the first question I have is, was there a, uh, was there a specific incident or a catalyst that drove you to begin developing uh, real-time crime and intelligence center? Yeah, there were, there were two big things that I noticed. In 2017, I was promoted to deputy chief of the investigations division. But within two weeks of being in that spot, we had a homicide. So obviously with the homicide, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of people sitting in a room with their individual laptop screens up, looking at maps, looking at intel. And I was like, gosh, we need something on the wall where people can start throwing stuff up on a screen, where we can start sharing the information there, have that visual picture of that and I, I mean right away I was like we are lacking in technology in this division as part of that duty as well all of our town special events fall under the investigations umbrella so I noticed the same things we have some very very large special events in our town and I'll never forget walking in a room for the first one and there were about 10 laptops set up each one of them with a different security camera over the special event and I was like this is completely inefficient as an incident commander, I wasn't comfortable with the way we were using that. I shouldn't have to walk screen to screen to screen to screen to screen to see what's going on in different areas of the event. And it just so happens 2017 in Philadelphia, I walked up to the Cinemassive booth and I, it was like the light went on. It was like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And that's actually where I met um, Dustin at, and started talking about it. And that was kind of, I, I, I knew, I thought I knew what I wanted or I had a picture of what I wanted. I knew it was a bunch of screens that could incorporate a lot of different feeds. And then I saw it at IACP um, at your guys' booth. And I knew right then I had to start working towards getting that for our police department. Gotcha. Um, well, that's certainly in line with what, with, uh, what we hear uh, from other folks in your situation. and. Um, I think the trend now is to move towards something that we call global common operating picture. And that's the ability to not just collect the information, but actually share it out, uh, you know, to, to, to different divisions or units or, or, you know, stakeholders and people that, you know, are going to help make decisions. So um, that is definitely a common thread. Um, so looking back now on the initial planning, is there any specific advice that you would give someone if they were just starting out the way you were? Yeah, there is. And that's take decision makers and take them to a site to see a real-time crime center in action. 
Um, one of the best things I did, even after it, it was when we were already further along with the project, was we went out to Sandy Springs, Georgia, and took a look at their center. And it was extremely, extremely helpful uh, for myself. And we, I brought a, our civilian deputy director with me. The chief wanted someone else. He had heard me talking about this quite a bit. He wanted someone else to lay eyes on it just to get another opinion on how he felt it might fit in with our department. And seeing that thing in action, and again, incorporating all of those different platforms, and then listening to another department on how they used it to get different ideas of how we want to leverage um, this system in our city was great and gave me great speaking points as we got to that budgeting time and speaking with city council and other city officials on what this was going to do for us. And even having them realize it's in the PD, but this is something that many other departments in our city can take advantage of. Our traffic and engineering department for traffic flow, our public works department when they're out plowing streets, what better than to bring intersection cameras up on the screen and see how those intersections look. The FD it scenes. Um, I could go on and on about how while it, it, I went in there with the intent of looking at it from a PD perspective, I see a more global um, application from a city perspective with this, uh, with this product. That's great. Um, and, you know, so speaking of that, you, you talk about connecting to, you know, other departments within your city, traffic management, emergency services, and city managers. What about connecting with um, adjacent law enforcement uh, groups and departments and the ability to share data there? Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I think we're just scratching the surface with that. Some of the recent events, um, in our city and in our country, you know, we've experienced the same things a lot of towns in the country have. It brought departments working together um, and they've spent time. We utilized it, the crime center, quite a bit during the protests we had in our town. And those departments seeing it, I still think we're not quite where we want to be in terms of department sharing and, and pooling things together to that. And I think we're learning how to work towards that. But I do see a ton of potential from that aspect of, you know, we have Aurora. Uh, next door that's looking at a similar product has a similar mindset of how to police their town as us really getting the word out to other towns and getting us to that point of working together from a central hub and utilizing the technology. So while we're not quite there, I think we'll get there. Well, that's great. I mean, uh, as you know, you know, we're, we're continuing to improve our platform to allow people to share information, but you know, sharing and collaboration is, is more than just technology. You know, you have to look at security aspects and, um, when you're looking at cases and things like that, you know, sometimes you have to be very careful, but uh, it's, it's good to know that, you know, you're starting to look at some of those challenges now. Um, so, you know, we never seem to hear from any anybody that we talk to that's, that's considering a real-time crime center or, or, um, or emergency operations center, nobody ever says, uh, you know, we've got all the, resources we could we could possibly use um this year from a in terms of helping you respond to criminal incidents or cases and things like that um it, does it help increase the efficiency is there like predictive value i mean you know what would you say about that so i i think the efficiency would be something i would really really um like to emphasize and i'll go back to the protest so you know we had this thing only starting in January, but what this technology did for us in allowing us to leverage, especially the video from, we, we ran our command out of our crime center. So in the past, incident commanders don't always have a great picture of what's going on, but with what we were able to do with security cameras, drone footage, all of those particular uh, pieces of technology allowed myself and the other deputy chief who ran all of these protests in our city the capability to see what was going on on the street, which made, which helped us make quicker decisions in terms of where we move people, how we deployed people, decisions we made, um, was that much better because we could see it. It wasn't trying to paint a picture in our heads from the intel we were getting on the street. It was us looking at the street, seeing what was going on and making decisions based off that. So from an efficiency standpoint, there is no doubt that this uh, was critical for us during all those incidents. Yeah, I would, 
I was going to ask you about that. That's another common theme that we're hearing when we go out and talk to police departments, fire departments, first responders is one of the biggest challenges now is there's there's extra responsibility with converging incidents and converging response, right, between COVID and, and some of the other things that are going on. So um, it sounds like you're certainly facing those those same challenges and, and the need to, to sometimes you know, change maybe the behavior or the operation, the operational elements of the, of the command center itself, depending on, you know, the incident and things like that, right? Yeah. And I mean, most of the time, uh, a command post is not going to be at the incident because the last thing you want is your leadership getting tied up in something where they're tied up in the mess, we like to call it, where they can't make the necessary decisions or they get locked up. So, our command posts are nowhere near it and have been that way for years. So um, again, to now have a picture instead of list, just listening, actually seeing um, has really helped us quite a bit. Great. I don't know, did that, um, answer, did that answer what your question was? Yeah, I, I, I think so. It's just, um, you know, sometimes these crime centers and these emergency operations centers are set up for, you know, maybe one or two purposes and, and all of a sudden you're faced with, you know, four or five different roles and, um, you know, they're having to, in some cases, change the, you know, the look and feel and, and you know, sort of the response profile with, with COVID and, and, you know, various other incidents. So, um, and then to, as a segue from what you're talking about with the command centers not being, uh, you know, directly adjacent to the incident, um, does your department leverage uh aerial video surveillance are you are you using uh drones and and other techniques to capture uh video that you know can give you situational awareness we are and it was this was the first time we really used it again in a in a big incident and it were these protests so to be able to there was a lot of marches that were going on and moving around so to have that aerial footage um as a city and again from the command post it gave us a good, it would capture, it would really help us get a picture of how big the crowd really was. The, the intersection cameras and the, and the cameras we have in different areas, that helps. But actually having the drone fly above and see that uh, displayed for us really gave us an idea of what was going on, the kind of the tenor of the crowd, uh, how things work. So we have plenty of peaceful protests. We only really had one night of riots and looting but we had a lot of protests and a lot of marches. So it was very helpful to see what was going on, what the movement was and uh, how things were within that. Right. Um, so obviously you're leveraging a lot of video. One of the other trends that we're seeing when we go out and talk, talk to other folks like yourselves is um, there seems to be an increasing reliance on social media. It seems to become, it's become very important for communicating, you know, with the citizens, really a two-way communication channel. Can you comment uh, on how you know you've seen the role of uh, social media increase within your department? Yeah, it's it's exponentially increased. Even in, and we've tried to be at the forefront of this with having social media pages starting all the way back um, to when I was a PIO in 2015. Facebook, Twitter, and now you get other platforms like uh, Snapchat and TikTok and all types of um, social media sites out there. So we have to follow those because that is, I don't want to say the wave of the future because it's here. That's how it was amazing to see. And I, and I keep referencing protests, but I think it's relevant because years ago you had to send out flyers, call people, schedule meetings at sites. You can whip a, whip something like a protest together or an event in a matter of hours, just simply by utilizing social media and having it spread virally um, through that. So so we have to monitor all of those social media channels. And then you get into Facebook Live or other live feeds where people will, again, whatever's going on, they're displaying it for the world to see. So we try to locate those when incidents are unfolding in our town to, again, have that firsthand knowledge. We're not relying on things being fed to us. We're actually watching it happen and able to make decisions on that. So, so to really have those platforms, understand them, how to access them, it's, a, it, it, it's an everyday learning experience for, for our department. And I feel blessed that we have the people we do doing it because they're fantastic 
at um, at navigating those different those different mediums. Well, that's good to hear. It sounds like you're on the forefront. Um, as you know, you know, social media brings its own challenges in terms of you know how do you consume that information. You sometimes you have to have dedicated uh, compute resources and things like that. So one of the things that we're, we've been working on over the last uh, six months or so is to introduce technology that can offload some of that processing, you know, from the GPU itself, because just by the nature of URL and web traffic, you know, it sort of brings the whole another challenge. And if you, if you're monitoring five or six channels, uh, it, it can be really tricky. So we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that. And we're trying to re sort of respond to that, you know, uptick. Um, so are there any, in terms of improvements, um, since you deployed your uh, crime center, um, do you have any any statistics or any uh, sort of quantitative you know improvements that you can share with us? No, in terms of actual like crime numbers being affected or things like that, because we are again our roll calls will hold them in the crime center and utilize statistics. But we're about probably about six months into actually using it, so to have something quantifiable to say, hey, this helped us here is too difficult at this time. And that and, and COVID really threw that for a loop. Our crime numbers, our crash numbers, all the measurables we would normally look at to say this is up or this is down are completely out of whack because of those um, those two main issues, especially COVID with how much it affected crime for that three to four month period. And even a little bit now, um, the biggest thing, as, I, as I've said, and we've kind of harped on here is just the efficiency of running larger scale operations um, and the benefit of that and how, again, seeing, having a vision come to reality and being able to run these, and those are the critical things, you know, the, um, the high risk, low frequency events and having this technology just for those and to be and to better lead those and, and uh, run those has been, it's already paid dividends from that end. Great. That's great. Um, so I guess, the last question that I've got is, um, do you have kind of a wish list? I mean, you, you can see where you're at now, and it sounds like there's been a lot of improvements, efficiency, and you know, you've kind of seen some of the payback that you expected. But looking into the future, I mean, what are the things that, you know, if you had to look in your crystal ball and say, you know, these are things that we'd like to introduce, or these are sources that we would, you know, like to be able to consume uh, to help kind of improve our situational awareness and collaboration? I think you hit it on the head with any software that helps us monitor social media better. I, I've seen a lot of things out there, but there's there's not the perfect software, and, and there never will be, but something to help us really run that. Um, I, I, from what I've seen so far, and, and when we ran the events out of there, there wasn't a lot in terms of, gosh, I wish I would have done this when I built the system or did that. It's now looking for different technologies to leverage. Is there a better crime mapping software that we would put up or predictive analysis software that we would utilize as a department? Um, but, but with, uh, you know, honestly, with the partnership we had and seeing other departments talking to other departments and then using Dustin's expertise in building ours. I mean, yes, I'd love more screens in the space that I have. I would um, love more inputs. You know, I, I'm, we are going to build a dispatch area because we had dispatch in all of these incidents uh, in the command post. So there's there's certain things we'd like to like to bring in, but as of right now, I couldn't have asked for a better solution um, than what we have right now. At least not that we've seen from a usability standpoint. That sounds great. I'm glad to hear it. Really appreciate Jason taking the time to walk us through some of what they've seen in their crime center since implementing this over in Naperville PD. Um, really want to highlight some of the specific things that he touched on and show you how we kind of address that today within Cinenet. Um, so first and foremost, and we see this all the time with crime centers, uh, when folks are trying to implement this type of solution, one of the things Jason talked about is when you walk into these spaces, um, even without a video, even with a video wall, um, is how do you identify where that content's coming from? So you're looking at multiple sources, uh, multiple assets, PCs, operator workstations, investigation workstations, things of that nature. Um, 
because normally, you know, let's say we bring up um, several news feeds. So I'm pretty easily able to discern, oh, I'm looking at Fox News, CBS, CNN. Um, here's another Fox News. You know, maybe this is a local channel or something. Um, so I'm pretty easily able to, that information is already tagged for me. So I can kind of understand where it's coming from and I have some immediate context for it. Um, Kind of what Jason was talking about is if I bring up this investigation standard view that I have saved on my system here, um, I really don't have that much awareness as to what I'm looking at. So I've got a PC up here, I've got a PC up here, uh, a third PC down here. This camera is coming from somewhere, maybe it's a direct feed into my system and I'm decoding it on the video wall processor or maybe it's coming off a laptop. Right now I don't know. Um, and then I've got this live earth view as well. I don't know where this information is coming from. Uh, so one of the things that we solve for is to be able to start tagging information. So I'm going to switch to the same view, but where I've just gone back through and tagged this information. So you now you know, okay, this PC is investigation one number one, this PC is investigation number two, number three, and number four. So I know where this information is coming from. This kind of really does two things for me very quickly is you know, one, I have a little bit more context to where this information is coming from. So if I'm making decisions in the room, um, I know where this is coming from, and now I know who to go to. Um, but also I know where it's coming from. You know, so if this is just coming from a camera, uh, we can all focus on that. And if I need someone to do a more detailed deep dive, I can ask them to do so on their workstation. Uh, so it just gives a little bit more context. Now these labels, you could label them whatever you want. Um, you know, you, it's free will. Um, and then you can color code them as well. So um, I've just done a couple in yellow and then I have this one in blue. Um, I've done this one in blue just specifically for contrast, uh, but you could begin, you know, color coding things based on where that information is coming from. Um, and kind of one of the other things that Jason touched on was uh, multiple, multiple departments working together. So I could color code my information based on whether it's coming from fire, emergency management, uh, if I have things coming from, you know, the traffic department or public works and then vice, vice versa, what is specifically coming from in the room if I want to have a specific color code for that um, or no color code. Um, so that's really, really powerful tool uh, to be able to kind of build that common operating picture and be able to quickly start making more decisions. So one of the other things I want to highlight real quick um, and this came up over the course of conversation a number of times is social media and how that plays into the real time crime center. Uh, you know, Jason had a really good point that, you know, social media is a very powerful tool for getting information out to communities, you know, whether that's a road closure or a weather event or any sort of event, um, you know, that potentially jeopardizes public safety. Um, you know, Facebook, Twitter are really good means of communications, but also in terms of the real-time crime center, it's um, a really good tool for getting information back in. So if you need to monitor things, um, you know, so maybe I'm monitoring an event, you know, obviously we can, you know, talk about the recent protests and things like that through a lot of the major cities um, where I'm bringing in a lot of information for the common operating picture. Um, you know, if I want to bring in Waze, you know, Waze might be a very powerful tool for me, although it's not generally considered social media, um, you know, it does fall into that bucket of, you know, real-time information that's coming from the community um, that users are submitting, you know, so I'm able to monitor maybe road closures or areas of condensed traffic, combine that with my traffic cameras coming from my TMC department. I'm now able to start painting that picture of what might be going on. Um, and then additionally, if I know there's an event, because maybe over here I'm monitoring something like Twitter, I'm following various hashtags, um, looking for this event to take place, I'm able to start monitoring protests with my drone footage. You know, So if I'm bringing in my drones, I can say, okay, well, I know these people are gathering here. I know that these roads are you know, starting to get backed up and my traffic folks are you know, monitoring that, and then I can get that information out to officers, uh, and then we can start to respond to that type of information very, very quickly. You know, the other thing with a lot of uh, website resources and social media is we know it's always kind of an ever-shifting landscape. 
of content. You know, that's always going to be a moving target, whether that information is coming from something like Facebook or it's coming from TikTok or Twitter or whatever the next big thing is going to be. Um, you'd be able to be to kind of shift with that um, on the fly, especially when you're, you know, talking about real time. Uh, you know, one of the things we do within Cinenet in terms of bringing in new content um, is we're always kind of prepared for that is, you know, if I have a new website that I need to add, maybe it's something uh, that I know is coming. Hey, there's this new social media platform coming. You know, we're going to create an account. We're going to log into it. Uh, I'd be able to name that whatever it is. Maybe it's TikTok of the future. Um, and I would just plug that website URL in there, save that and have it. Uh, additionally, this is really nice because if I need something that's on the fly that's not already in my system that I need to pro permanently pull up uh, or temporarily pull up for an event, I could easily do so. Um, so maybe I'm monitoring some sort of, um, you know, maybe it's a, a running event for my community um, and that there's a live stream camera that the running event is hosting at the finish line. I'd be able to easily bring that into my system, additionally along with all my other uh, visual information from, you know, traffic, ways, things like that. Um, and additionally, through Cinenet, you could actually control that, those various web analytic applications. Um, so I just have Live Earth pulled up here. Um, you know, but just like I would any website, if I want to interact with it, I easily could do so. So we'll pause there. Um, definitely open it up to q and I think there's a lot of real good information um, in this course of this conversation and a lot of things that we could cover in terms of, you know, best practices, um, future proofing your real time crime center, and then sort of, you know, what we're seeing out there today in terms of, you know, sources and content. So let's open it up. All right, Dustin. Thank you for that overview of how Synonet's being used throughout real time crime centers. If anyone is interested in seeing an interactive demo specifically for your organization, please email us at sales at cinemassive.com and we'd be happy to schedule some time with you. Again, that's sales at cinemassive.com. Now let's go ahead and move on to the question and answer. Please feel free to submit all questions you have in the lower right hand corner. You have to click on the small question mark icon and then we should be able to see them and we'll start getting them through for you. All right, let's see, first up, can you give examples of coalitions of first responders working together with your platform? Yep, absolutely. Um, that's a really great question. And um, I mean, Oxford uh, PD out in Alabama is a really great example of their East Metro Area Crime Center. Um, they built that facility with um, the other cities and counties around them in mind. So it wasn't just about Oxford PD and their ability to monitor a the situation. They built that facility to house um, neighboring PDs and sheriff's office so they could all work together because um, they realized, you know, anytime there's an event or a crime, um, you know, as that person is, you know, uh, being pursued or whatever, it could go from city to city, county to county. Um, and then, you know, city of Chesapeake very recently, um, you know, in talking to them out in Virginia, they've got a PSOC uh, with EOC and 911 in there, but they uh, during the recent protests, they didn't have a real-time crime center, and they were able to um, have the PD come there and monitor those events um, throughout the community. So, you know, you can really open it up to supporting multiple departments within your own uh, community and city, but also, you know, your neighboring cities as well and your sheriff's offices. Um, and then, obviously, if you need to bring in, you know, sort of federal agencies as well, um, you know, you can prepare desk space or rooms for them. All right, excellent. Moving on, next question up. Can real-time crime centers be funded through the CARES Act? Uh, yeah, that's actually been a very hot topic over the course of the last two or three months. Um, we've got a number of customers that are funding projects through CARES. Um, so RTCCs and Intel centers in particular um, do fall under that category. Um, you know, there are some I guess I don't want to say spending limitations, but there's definitely a timeline to have that funding spend by the end of the year. Um, but yeah, this definitely falls under that public safety response. And, you know, just kind of what we were talking about with coalitions and emergency management um, is the ability for these centers for um, everybody in the city to make use of it. Um, I've seen traffic control centers that um, have been repurposed for 
EOC and event monitoring where there was no central large EOC or it was just a stand up EOC. Um, and those traffic centers had to become um, temporary EOCs or crime centers during those events. Excellent. Up next, are Cinemassive products 100% made in the USA? Federal and DOD entities, um, and for that very reason, all our products are TAA compliant. All right, excellent. And now, can you tell me more about on-scene inputs? Do the officers on scene have to have additional hardware to send their inputs to the command center? Um, I guess that would really depend on the input and what the feed is. Um, generally, you know, I guess I'll just use the example of like a, a drone feed. Um, if I have a drone system, a lot of times that um, provider of the drone is giving me uh, the signal back to where I need to receive it, whether as a crime center, the PD, uh, whatever, you know, that cellular bridge or VLAN or VPN, um, that's built into it. So that's going to be able to bring it back. Um, and I guess if you were talking specifically maybe about something like body cameras, uh, once again, you know, if you were working with like Axon or something, um, typically they give you the ability to bring that footage back. Um, on the flip side of that is the system does have the ability to decode RTSP streams. So um, I've had clients that, you know, bring out pole cameras on trailers. They set those up for various events. Um, they own those cameras. They own the um, telecommunications pathway back to the PD, um, and they're able to bring that in directly. So I guess in summarize, it really depends on um, what hardware is and the purpose of it. Uh, but yeah. All right. And next up. Where is most of the cost in deploying an RTCC? Yeah, so, um, I mean, most of the costs can be attributed to, I guess I would say, screens and the mission criticality of those screens. Um, you know, we as Cinemassive, anytime we approach an RTCC project or really any project that we work on, um, we're going in with the assumption that it's a 24-7, 365 space. Um, and even if your EOC is stand-up, you still kind of have to go in with, that, in with that same mentality because you don't know when it needs to be fired up. It always needs to be ready to go 24-7, 365. Um, whereas, you know, maybe something like digital signage or house worship, um, it's not, it wouldn't be necessarily deemed mission critical. Um, and then the other thing that we see is just the reoccurring cost to maintain a system uh, where we have really pivoted with Cinenet and our software side and you kind of saw that briefly on the demo, it was just flexibility and simplicity. Um, so, you know, in terms of having to have a dedicated integrator and someone on site to maintain that system and trained, um, as well as any changes that need to be made to that system and coded to that system and deployed, um, those costs are nor uh, that you would normally see are virtually eliminated through Cinenet. Um, so any changes you want to make over time, you can, and there's not necessarily a reoccurring cost associated with it. All right. Now we have, we need to access a lot of websites for our video wall. Has your new product for handling this situation actually been installed with customers? Customers across uh, varying um, use cases. So network operations, security operations, and public safety and traffic management are all using Cine Agent, um, which is what we recently deployed this year to handle websites. Um, and a large part of that concept was um, you know, historically, if you wanted to bring up a website, you needed some sort of PC to host it. Um, and I'll use like web EOC as a perfect example where I might not necessarily be always interacting and changing that view. Um, so at that point to host it on, let's say my laptop in an EOC or a crime center, I'm using my own desktop real estate to do so, which I could otherwise be using for investigation or working, uh, you know, communications, whatever why not just offload that to Cine agent and let that host it? Um, and then it's also solves for the KVM issue as well, because you can still interact with it through a single pane of glass through Cinenet software. Um, and that would support a number of um, applications in terms of, you know, uh, Live Earth, uh, VMS, Web EOC, you know, all your social media, um, really any URL that you want to throw at it, you could host on Cine agent, offload from having to host on one of your own workstations. Okay, great. Up next, we've got, would you say the number one wish of most crime centers is they wish they had more space overall? 
I actually, that's probably the uh, one comment that I hear echoed pretty commonly is either we wish we had more space or, you know, and I, you know, I know Jason kind of said it jokingly that he wish he had more screens, um, but that is pretty common, you know, um, you know, budget dictates what can be built um, and what can be deployed for, you know, a uh, center at a given time. But, um, the, you know, that's the one thing is, you know, you always plan for the future. Um, you know, it's certainly something that we always take into account when we're talking to potential clients and working through projects is, you know, yeah, we understand the day one requirements, but where do you see yourself in, you know, two, three, five years, you know, where, you know, cause it's, it's pretty common that everyone wants to, um, build a bigger space, add more desk space, more operators, more analysts, uh, into a crime center. So it's definitely some one of the things that we look at. All right. Next question. If you had to pick one feature in your product that sets you apart, what would it be? Yeah, I would say, you know, simplicity. Um, one of the things that I really like about Cinenet is that it is, you know, it is a drag and drop interface. It runs through, you know, your web browser. So, you know, if you have an iPad or Microsoft Surface Pro tablet, you know, you can very easily just drag and drop your content, be able to create layouts. Um, begin to sort of mold it to whatever you need to for your workflow. And a large part of that is just our own investment as a company and, you know, UI and UX developers to uh, realize that vision. You know, I mean, you can have the uh, best coders in the world doing the best features, um, but it has to be usable. Um, and I've seen a number of chiefs of police and deputy chiefs come into our facility um, and be hands-on within 10 minutes of never seeing Synonet and start using it and understand it and be able to start manipulating, you know, content on a display or a video wall. All right, next question up. We have hundreds of cameras throughout our city managed by a VMS. Can you interoperate with a VMS? Is to accomplish that, but we are VMS agnostic. So if you're using Genetech, Milestone, uh, we can easily integrate those into um, any, any crime center solution. All right. No. Uh, do you have an analytics portion running within the platform, or is your product a means of visualizing analytic pieces separate from you? It is handled outside of Synonet and off of the processor. And really, that's just because the analytics can be very dependent on, you know, the software or the hardware that it's coming from. Um, obviously, there are certain cameras that you could put on the street um, that run analytics internally. Um, I think GridSmart's one of those that, you know, you can have counters on there. And, you know, obviously if you have LPRs and things like that, some of that's offloaded directly on that hardware appliance. Um, and then as well as, you know, you can have software, additional hardware capturing stuff on your end, um, you know, similar to you would with, you know, anything like Live Earth or a CAD system or something like that. Um, so it's, you know, large and by and large a means of visual communication. All right, excellent. We have a few questions remaining. If anyone else has anything else they'd like to ask, please use the time to go ahead and submit them now. Uh, up next, uh, what do you consider mission critical? Yeah, so kind of what I mentioned before, I mean, anywhere there's really a 24-7, 365 uh, requirement is immediately mission critical. Um, any space where you're going to have multiple shifts and operators um, would be deemed mission critical. Um, and those are, you know, where we focus our technology on, where we build a lot of um, our hardware platform is around that mission critical capabilities, um, thinking of things like redundancy, video redundancy, power redundancy, um, all that. Whereas, you know, maybe obviously we don't do digital signage um, is not necessarily mission critical. I mean, if it goes down, yeah, that's upsetting, but, um, you know, it's not preventing anybody from saving lives. Whereas, you know, a crime center, we have to take all that into account. Um, there is, you know, ultimately somebody on the other end of the line or phone uh, whose life could be depending on that system and that response. All right. Up next, how fast can you deploy a real-time crime center? Um, you know, we've done a number of projects over the years that range in terms of capabilities. Um, we've done crime centers that was, you know, a 15 by 15 
room that had six analysts and we've done crime centers uh, recently for, you know, a city with a population over a million. Um, and we got, we were able to get that done in, you know, under 70 days. And it obviously those were under particular circumstances. Um, but on average, I mean, it takes from, you know, a time of notice to proceed to actually deploy um, usually about 90 to 120 days to get a crime center fully up and running. All right. And do you have any other law enforcement customers we can speak with? Uh, yeah. I mean, if there is ever a law enforcement customer or someone you want to talk shop with, please feel free to reach out to sales at Cinemassive. Um, either one of my, myself or one of my associates will work to find someone, you know, regionally in your area. If you want to meet with them in person, obviously, you know, that might have some restrictions attached to it with COVID. Um, but we can certainly find someone that maybe is incomparable in terms of, you know, city or solution that you're looking to do um, and put you in touch with them. All right. Terrific. It looks like all the questions we have today. Everyone, thank you so much for attending and joining us with us today. You'll be receiving an email shortly with a link to this recorded presentation so you can review it whenever you'd like. We hope to see you there and look forward to our next events. Thanks.